Hey everyone, in this video, I want to dive into the new Azure Files Provision V2 billing model that we now have available. At the time of recording, it's only available in a limited number of regions, but that's gonna obviously expand over time. Now, Azure Files is one of the core services we get as part of a storage account, along with blob, queues, and tables. And there's a number of different offerings and types that we can have. Now, for the standard or hard disk drive based tier, we normally pay based on the consumed amount of capacity and the number and the type of the various transactions we perform. So if I think about, we have the standard, so that's the hard disk drive. This is pay as you go, uh, consumption based, which is what we're used to. So the idea here is what I pay for is the capacity I'm using, and then I pay for the number of the various types of operations. Now, the amount I pay varies on the specific type of operation. For example, a write operation, a list operation, costs significantly more than something like a read operation. And there's some other types of operations in there as well. This is very similar to the blob model. And additionally, I can specify a tier. And the tier gives me that ability to balance, well, what's the amount of capacity I think I'm gonna use compared to the operations I'm gonna perform against it. And if we actually jump over and we can take a look at the pricing page, we can see exactly that. You can see we have these three different tiers, transaction optimized, hot and cool. And really the hotter it is, I pay more for the capacity, but then I pay less for the transactions I perform against it. And you can see here that those write and list transactions cost significantly more than things like a read transaction. And what actually happens very commonly is customers run hotter, so they pick a, a hotter tier than they actually need to be. Additionally, because I can have an unlimited number of shares in a storage account, I only get storage account level metrics, i.e. I can't see at a per share level what the number of transactions are, which can make it difficult to know exactly what I need and what I'm doing at a share level. Additionally, because I can have an unlimited number of shares, technically I can overcommit the storage account. If I create too many shares in a storage account, then what I think I might be able to achieve with a share, I can't because I'm maxing out that underlying storage account. And so that pay as you go can be challenging for customers because it's very hard to predict the costs because it's gonna vary based on what I consume it's also can be very hard to estimate. Typically what has to happen is I deploy to it, I let it run, so then I can see, well, how many and what are the types of transactions I'm performing to work out what my bill is gonna be. Because as a customer, I'm not really used to understanding a write transaction, a list transaction, a read transaction. We're more used to seeing things like IOPS and throughput. So that's the, the standard, the, the pay go, for a regular Azure File Standard Share. But then also what we have is a premium offering. So if I go and think about the premium offering, this is based on SSD type storage. And what we have with premium is it's provisioned based billing. And we'll call this actually the provisioned V1 model. And what I do here is I pay for the provisioned amount of capacity. So my bill is the capacity provisioned. Hey, I want a share of 500 Gibby bytes. And what happens here is I get a corresponding amount of IOPS and throughput based on the capacity I provision. So if I think about, I tell it the amount of capacity I want, well then the amount of IOPS I get 
and the amount of throughput I get scales linearly based on that capacity I provision. So I'm not paying for the amount of capacity I'm using. I'm not paying for the amount of IOPS and throughput I'm using. I pay for the amount I provision. And that's really a key point about this. And essentially that IOPS and throughput, the documentation goes through the math, but it's just a multiplier of the provisioned amount of capacity. And what can happen here is I might create a share significantly bigger than what I actually need because I need the associated higher performance. So this is a lot more similar to the Azure Disks type model. But a huge benefit here is I know what my bill's gonna be. I know exactly what I'm paying for because I'm provisioning that amount of capacity. And because it's directly linked, I know the performance I'm gonna get but a downside of that is I may pay for a dimension like capacity or even IOPS that I don't need. Hey, maybe I need a lot of capacity, but I don't need a high performance when I'm getting a high performance. Maybe I need a high performance, but I don't need a high capacity when I'm getting a higher capacity. They are directly linked together. But at least I know exactly what my bill is gonna be. So what we have now is a new V2 provisioned billing option. Now today, this V2, go over here, only applies to the standard. So now what I've got is my provisioned V2, but it is only that standard, the hard disk drive. But I'm gonna say today because Absolutely, this is something that's gonna get planned for premium as well. I don't know exactly when that's gonna be, but expect to see this expand into the premium world. And what you might guess is what this is gonna do is now I get independent dials for the capacity. I provision. So that's a big difference here. I tell it, the amount of capacity I want to be available. I pay for that provision capacity, not the amount I'm using. I'm also paying for the provisioned amount of IOPS and the provisioned amount of throughput. But these are independent dials. There is not a direct correlation between the capacity and the IOPS and the throughput. I individually, when I go and create one of these shares, I say the capacity I want, uh, the IOPS I want and the throughput I want. Now, these are dynamic. I can just go and change these whenever I want. But if I increase those numbers, I have to wait at least 24 hours after I increase to be able to scale it back down again. So just a, a key point about that. Another really nice thing here is, is, well, okay, I'm doing this provisioned amount and one of the very typical things we see with files is I do get these bursts of IOPS. So maybe, hey, I've got a fairly steady amount of normal type IOPS activity, but I do have to burst occasionally. So one of the great things I get with this provisioned V2 model is the ability to burst my IOPS. So if I consider that I'm paying for a provisioned amount of IOPS, so let's say that is my provisioned IOPS. And then I'm gonna use a certain amount. Now, if my usage is below that provisioned amount, what I'm actually getting here is I have this IOPS burst bucket. So if I'm consuming less than what I'm paying for that provisioned IOPS, when I start accruing credit. So my IOPS bucket, it starts going up. So the longer I'm running below that provisioned amount, whatever that delta is between what's provisioned and what I'm actually using, well, my, my bucket goes up. So then what happens if I get this burst of IOPS activity, well, it just starts consuming the credits I've got in my bucket. And maybe it's just a little bit of burst. It will just keep being able to go on a best efforts basis above that provisioned amount as long as there are credits left in my bucket. So this is really useful when I do have those unanticipated peaks. And I can actually track it. There's a per share metric burst credits for IOPS so I can track what's in that IOPS bucket and 
hey, I can plan accordingly to that. Throughput is not typically such a challenge, so there isn't a burst bucket uh, just for throughput. Now, to use the provision V2, it's something I actually set at the storage account level. So when I create the storage account, I have to tell it, hey, I want to use the provisioned V2 types as a storage account setting. And when you do this, what it's actually going to do is it's going to set it to be this um, V2 type SKU, and it's going to tell it to be um, file storage only. In fact, if we jump over super quickly, so if I go and look at my storage accounts, in fact, it was right there in front of me. But if I quickly go and find my storage account again, there it is. If I look at the JSON view, we can specifically see. So what happens here is it's a V2 SKU name type and the kind is set to file storage. So that means I can only create Azure files, shares within it. Here you can see for the data storage, it only shows me file shares. There's no blob or queue or table. So when I create one of these, and again, today it's in a limited number of regions, but as soon as I select a region that has this support, so I'm gonna do West US 2, I have to set the primary service as Azure Files, and it's standard, and you saw as soon as I selected Azure Files, now, I get this option. Now I can go ahead and pick provisioned V2. And that will cause it to be one of those V2 SKU name uh, types. And it will set it to be that file storage account kind. Now, one of the interesting things, obviously, if I'm using Azure policy to restrict the types of SKUs I can have, maybe I don't want anyone to ever create LRS. It should be zone redundant or GRS. You need to go and update your uh, Azure policies to include the V2 types for ZRS and GRS, or they wouldn't be able to use those. So it's just kind of an important point to do that. And again, the documentation goes through all of the different regions where this is supported, but it's, it's going to obviously grow out over time. Then what happens is when I create a V2 provision file share, I tell it these three dimensions. Now, one of the nice things we actually get here is for the numbers, the capacity can be all the way up to 256 tebibytes, so bigger than a regular pay-as-you-go, even large file share, up to 50,000 IOPS, and up to, um, I think it's five gibibytes per second. Now, the minimums is 32 gibibytes. It's 500 IOPS and it's 60 maybe bytes a second. And it will give you a recommendation based on the amount of capacity you specify. So if we go and look, if I just go back to my storage account I've already got, and I look at my file share, See, I've got one already and I've configured it to be the minimums. When I create a new file share, if I just put in a size, it's just going to recommend a certain amount of IOPS and throughput. So I can just let it use. And that's, you can see it's changing based on the amount I enter. But I can just say manually specify. And then I can put in whatever the values I actually need based on my throughput. So I have this ability to configure exactly what I want, but I can also change it at any time afterwards. Hey, I have some existing file share. I've seen it running for a certain time. I can just go and change the size and performance. And then I can modify those values to exactly what I need. So I get a massive amount of flexibility here. Now, one of the things to bear in mind is there are still account level limits. But one of the things you'll notice here is, well, there's a 50 share maximum, 
it shows on the main page how I'm tracking towards those limits. So it's saying, hey, I've got one of 50 file shares created already. I'm using 32 of this massive number of uh, Gibby bytes that a storage account can support. How many IUPS I'm using of what the storage accounts can support and the provision throughput of what the storage account can support. And when I actually create one of those file shares, it will not let me exceed what the storage account that underlies this can actually support. So that, that's a, a really great capability. Now, one of the other things I get with this is file share level monitoring, which is a really useful thing. So not only do I get those metrics around what is the current state of my bucket, but it's also going to show me what is the maximum number of IOPS, the maximum amount of throughput that I've used over a selected amount of time. There are also specific logs that I'll see if I'm being throttled for my IOPS, if I'm being throttled for my throughput. So there's a success with throttling. If I get throttled on my first attempt but succeed after retries, there's a success with share IOPS throttling. So that would tell me if I was being throttled due to IOPS throttling, but I succeed after retries. So I might even then go and, if I'm seeing those throttlings, make a decision. Maybe I'm being throttled, but I'm still meeting the requirements I have around performance. I don't have to do anything. If I'm being throttled a lot, and maybe I'm not seeing what I want, or as you saw, I can easily go in and just tweak these dials at any time to get the performance that I want. But I have full control. I'm not gonna get some bill that I don't expect, which is a really nice capability with this. Now today, it is standard only, which means it's an SMB file share. Uh, I can't do NFS shares, that's a premium capability. It does work with things like Azure File Syncs, which actually, this is a really nice option for Azure File Sync, because one of the things Azure File Sync does is for an on-prem file share, there's sort of a, a journaling log, it knows when things change. It doesn't have that in the Azure file share. So it has to constantly do these list operations. Well, as we saw, list operations are pretty expensive. That's so one of the things I can get penalized a little bit is when I use Azure file sync, I get these list operations. So I pay a bit more for my Azure file share. If I switch this provision V2 model, there's no differentiation between the type of operation. It's IOPS and throughput. So I'll actually probably save money in that scenario. So as a customer, where do I land on this? If I want better control, if I want better predictability, then this new uh, provision V2 option is probably gonna be the best thing for you. Most customers in a production environment, this is likely gonna be the best option. Caveat though, if I have a very small amount of data, if I'm playing around with it, if maybe I just have a file share of a couple of tools on it, then sticking with pay as you go may be better because look at these minimums. So the 32 Gibby bytes, you don't pay much for capacity. Um, 60 maybe bytes throughput, you don't pay much for throughput, but the 500 IOPS, that's I think about $20 a month just for that minimum. So if I had a little tools file share, if I say I'm really not using, I had a lot of them, Paygo still may be the better option if it's just that very ad hoc type share. So just. Keep that in mind, think about those things, but for most production workloads, um, the provision V2 is gonna be the best option. And there is no plan to get rid of the, the pay as you go. So if you prefer that variable billing nature, that's better for your use case, hey, you can just carry on using it. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope this was useful. Until the next video, take care.